Hello, this is Homer Knox of MenTeachingMen.com. In this video, I'm going to be teaching on King David, Part 2, Just a Wonderful Man of God. The New American Standard and King James Version Bibles will be used for our scripture translation in this video, and there will be several discussion questions at the end of this video. Hello, this is Homer Knox with MenTeachingMen.com. I'm going to be teaching on this video on the subject of King David. This is our second video in this series. And so I would like to give credit to the late uh, Dr. Vernon McGee for his many insights on King David. And I have listed below an address to his website, which might be helpful to you. King David is a special, a special man of God. And in this teaching, we're going to be looking at some of his errors, some of his blunders that he made in his life. David's sins not only affected his life, but also his family's life. And that's what sin does. It not only affects you, but it affects others too. Studies from King David's life. Number one, if it is written in the Bible, there is a reason. I might not understand the reason why many items are mentioned in the scriptures, but I do have an understanding that it is there for a reason. They are there for a purpose. And with many scriptures, the Holy Spirit has to give us revelation on these items. So I do understand that there are no insignificant scriptures in the Bible. The word begot is used 144 times in the scripture. It means to bring a child into existence. Most of these scriptures aren't relevant to me, but it did matter when Israel was reviewing the genealogy of the priestly line after they returned from captivity in Babylon. Also, we can look at the lineage for Jesus Christ. How wonderful, how wonderful. So various scriptures may be significant for other times in history than for our own. Studies from King David's life. Number two, God created us to work, not undisciplined slackness. Brothers and sisters, let's keep busy in our work with our family and with our church. There are many times, weekends, vacation, holiday times, to rest and recuperate. But we should strive for a busy life. 2 Samuel 11, 1-2 Then it happened in the spring, at the time when kings go out to battle. But David stayed at Jerusalem. God is usually concise in his wording in the Bible, and he's making a point that this is the norm. Kings do battle at this time of the year. But David didn't do that. His army was battling at the time, and he didn't go with them. Well, why? Why? I don't know. It doesn't say. What it caused was idleness on David's part. Possibly he was comfortable in his new palace, which he had built. Sometimes property and luxury can become a hindrance to us. He's at the wrong place at the wrong time. 2 Samuel 11.2 Now when evening came, David arose from his bed, and walked around on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing. I can guarantee you that the Holy Spirit tries to stop King David from what's going to happen next, and the king would not listen. David's flesh won out. In my life, I can remember several instances when I moved ahead grieving the Spirit. I can also remember many instances when I obeyed the Spirit and was saved from sin and its punishment. Praise God for the help of the Holy Spirit. One of the things I now regret that I didn't take up some type of hobby after I started my family. I was all family guy, which is good, but I think some non-family activities would have helped me grow in maturity and provided friendships, which we all need. Church softball, church golf, something. Church camp, something as a hobby. Galatians 5.16 But I say, Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Ephesians 4.30 Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. 2 Samuel 11, 4 4-5 David sent messengers and took her, and when she came to him, he lay with her. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, and said, I am pregnant. Pregnant, huh? Boy, that must have been a hard pill for King David to swallow. Well, now what's he going to do? What he should have done is confess his sin to God, maybe to others, right then. His sin was not caused because 
King David didn't have female companionship. King David had seven wives at this point in his life and several concubines. King David was in his 50s. Maybe he had a midlife crisis. No matter what crisis we are in, the Holy Spirit can help us and protect us from sinning. Thank you, Jesus, if we listen to him. Studies from King David's life. Number three, when we mess up, allow righteousness and the Holy Spirit's help with its resolution. Do the right thing. Confess. Take what's coming to you. This will all pass, or at least diminish at some point, and you can move on with your life. 2 Samuel 11, 6. Then David sent to Joab, the army commander, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite, who was Bathsheba's husband. So Joab sent Uriah to David. Well, what's King David going to do? Express remorse to Uriah? Beg forgiveness? Compensate Uriah? No, David tries twice to get him to go home so David could say, Well, Uriah is the father of this child. 2 Samuel 11, 8. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. But Uriah is having none of this. I think he knows what's up with David and Bathsheba. 2 Samuel 11, 9. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord. It did not get down to his house. King David tries without success to blame Uriah. So now David had enough, and he's going to kill Uriah with his army. 2 Samuel eleven fifteen, King David's letter to Joab. Place Uriah in the front line of the fiercest battle and withdraw from him so that he may be struck down and die. 2 Samuel eleven twenty three to 24 Verse 23, The messenger said to David, Verse 24, And your servant Uriah the Hittite is also dead. Well, Uriah is killed. King David has moved from idleness to adultery to trickery and now murder. During this entire time, no repentance on David's part, no restoration, and no forgiveness by God. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. 2 Samuel 11:27. When the time of mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife. Then she bore him a son. But the thing that David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord. A child is born to David in Bathsheba, a son. No shame with this guy, is there? What do you think David's other wives were thinking about all this? Hmm. What about the priests and the men of God that King David dealt with? What were they thinking? Most likely they knew all about this. Numbers 32, 23. And be sure your sin will find you out. It is at least nine months from the affair, and God is going to use a great man of God, the prophet Nathan, to step in and pronounce judgment on King David for all these sins. It's always better to confess our sins as soon as we realize we've sinned. Don't hold back. We know that God will forgive us by the blood of Jesus Christ. There might be consequences for your sin, as we are going to see with King David. 2 Samuel 12.1 Then the Lord sent Nathan, the prophet, to David. I'm not going to go over the judgments and the punishment God inflicted upon King David, as I previously taught on this on the video entitled The Prophet Nathan. And the link to that video is listed below. This can be all hard, but King David's crimes were vicious. Studies from King David's life. Number four, make it right before God, yourself, and others. King David's sins are the exception in his life and should not be allowed to have us forget the wonderful greatness in him. The man of God might unfortunately get into sin, but he won't stay there. 2 Samuel 12, 13. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has taken away your sin. You shall not die. David comes to his senses now and confesses right away. And it's not just words with David, but the heart. Many of us just confess our sins verbally without involving a heart change and remorsefulness. And that is why we continue sinning. Our confession of our sin should go with a renewed attitude and commitment 
that we will stop doing the sin. King David confesses from the heart and is remorseful. 2 Samuel 12, 14. Nathan the prophet is speaking. However, because by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born to you shall surely die. 2 Samuel 12:15 So Nathan went to his house. Then the Lord struck the child that Uriah's widow bore to David, so that he was very sick. 2 Samuel 12:16 David therefore inquired of God for the child, and David fasted and went and lay all night on the ground. Verse 18 Then it happened on the seventh day that the child died. Look what King David does. He prostrates himself all night praying for the child. How many of us would do that? My, oh my, seven days on his face praying for this child. Wonderful, fantastic on David's part. Scripture tells us why he did this and shows his heart and his understanding of God's compassion and love for him. 2 Samuel 12, 22. King David is talking. While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me that the child may live. Why didn't God just kill the child immediately? Because our Lord God is working to rehabilitate King David and draw David to himself. Well, we need to talk about Ammon and Tamar. Ammon was David's firstborn and possibly the heir to David's throne. Tamar was David's daughter, Ammon's half-sister, Absalom's sister. Ammon was infatuated with his sister Tamar, and so he rapes her. He schemes and rapes her. Didn't we just see sexual sin with Ammon's father, King David? Well, the Old Testament law outlines the punishment for this crime. Deuteronomy 22, 28-29 If a man finds a girl who is a virgin, and seizes her and lies with her, Verse 29, Then the man who lay with her shall give to the girl's father fifty shekels of silver, and she shall become his wife. Well, what does David do about all this? 2 Samuel 13, 21. Now when King David heard of all these matters, he was very angry. Studies from King David's life. Number five, love your children greatly, but don't neglect disciplining them. Scripture tells us that he's angry, but doesn't say any more from King David. No punishment is listed for Ammon. What's up with this? Even today, there would be jail time, and there are places and people that would string Ammon up for his horrible crime. We are going to see a weakness in King David in the area of disciplining his children. 2 Samuel 13, 28. Absalom commanded his servants, saying, See now. When Ammon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say to you, strike Ammon, then put him to death. What type of example did King David set for his children? He's the leader of his family and the nation Israel. King David's son Absalom murders Ammon for raping his sister Tamar. Didn't we just see murder by Absalom's father, King David? What does all this tell us about the sins of the father? And if your parents had done some shady things, discipline yourself not to follow their footsteps. Let the Holy Spirit help you to break generational curses. Galatians 5.16 But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. After Absalom kills Ammon, he flees near Syria, and he's hiding out there. King David gets word falsely, that Absalom had killed all his sons, and so he and his servants are distraught. Well, his sons arrive back home, and there is great weeping. 2 Samuel 13, 36. The king's sons came and lifted their voices and wept, and also the king and all his servants wept very bitterly. Weeping very bitterly. I didn't see anywhere that David wept bitterly when he committed adultery with Bathsheba or when he killed her husband, Uriah. No bitter weeping then. After the sin and punishment, then came the weeping for King David. 2 Samuel 14, 1. Now Joab, the army commander, perceived that the king's heart was inclined toward Absalom. 
We talked before about King David having a great love for his children, and this is particularly so with Absalom. Absalom was probably King David's favorite. The short story is that Joab encourages King David to allow Absalom to come back from exile in Sirius, and King David agrees to this. 2 Samuel 14, 24, and 28. However, the king said, Let him turn to his own house, and let him not see my face. Verse 28. Now Absalom lived two full years in Jerusalem and did not see the king's face. What? Absalom is in town two years and King David doesn't see him. Unbelievable, unbelievably. Possibly that David never gave Absalom full forgiveness. What do you think Absalom was doing all this time? I can tell you he wasn't planning good for King David, but rebellion. What is the example we have in the scriptures on a sinner repenting before his father? Luke 15, 20. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Let's try to forgive completely, and we can with the Holy Spirit's help. Sometimes this is very hard for us to do, but we can do it. Doesn't mention in the scriptures that Absalom repented. I don't think he repented at all. He did much more plotting against King David than repenting. The rebuke of God and payments for his sin are going to be catching up to King David now. Absalom leads a rebellion against King David and David flees Jerusalem. We know that King David loved Jerusalem and we can assume he wanted to spare Jerusalem the effects of a battle and possibly a siege. 2 Samuel 15, 14, David said to all his servants, Arise and let us flee, for otherwise none of us will escape from Absalom. Go in haste, or he will overtake us quickly and bring down calamity on us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. Well, we know that King David made heirs, but he was a fair and just king. He had many friends and many of his nation's people loved him. 2 Samuel 15:23. While all the country was weeping with a loud voice, all the people passed over. David had an understanding that all that is going to happen now is in judgment from God against him. 2 Samuel 15.25 King David is speaking. The king said to Zandork, Return the ark of God to the city. If I find favor in the sight of the Lord, then he will bring me back again and show me both it and his habitation. As David is leaving Jerusalem, a man of the house of Saul comes out, cursing him and throwing stones at King David. 2 Samuel 16, 7. Thus Shimei said when he cursed, Get out, get out, you man of bloodshed and worthless fellow. Well, what's David's response? 2 Samuel 16, 11. Behold, my son who came out from me seeks my life. How much more now this Benjamite? Let him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him. King David had an understanding and acceptance of the price he was going to pay for his sins. The prophet Nathan had prophesied what was going to happen to King David. We get forgiveness by the blood of Jesus Christ, but many times the results of our sins are very unpleasant. Summary of studies from King David's life. Number one, if it is written in the Bible, there is a reason. Number two, God created us to work, not for undisciplined slackness. Number three, when we mess up, allow righteousness and the Holy Spirit to help. Number four, make it right before God, yourself, and others. Number five, love your children greatly, but don't neglect disciplining them. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for the transparency of King David's life and the lessons of his sins and obediences that we can strive to please a holy God. There will be a future teaching on King David, part three. Discussion questions. Number one, what are the ways we can prevent sin creeping into our lives? Number two, do you have others, like Nathan, speaking into your life to try to prevent you from falling away into sin? Number three, which 10 commandments did King David break? Do you occasionally break any commandments? Which ones? 
If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to the Men Teaching Men YouTube channel. Thanks so much for watching. Hello, this is Homer Knox again. I hope you enjoyed this video teaching. The question I have for you is, are you born again? Do you know Jesus as your personal Savior? And are you saved? If not, why not? Why not? Jesus was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He suffered and died under Pontius Pilate and the Romans. He was buried and he rose from the dead on the third day. He's now ascended into heaven and is seating at the right hand of the Father. There is salvation in no one else, no one else. And so if this has stirred your heart and you would like to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, please pray with me. Dear Jesus, please come into my heart. Forgive me of all my sins, all my sins. Thank you for giving me the Holy Spirit. Thank you for making me a new creature. And thank you for loving me and dying for me. Amen and amen. If you prayed this prayer for the first time from your heart, you're now born again, you're a Christian, you're part of the family. Praise God, praise God. Welcome, welcome. If you prayed this prayer after slipping away, you're back in the kingdom, you're back in the fold. Congratulations, congratulations. There's another teaching on the menteachingmen.com website entitled, I just got saved, now what? And that video will help you on your new walk with Jesus Christ. God bless you. God bless you. Amen.